Welcome, everyone, to a brand new season of The Jesus Trip. It has been more than four years since I was putting these out on a weekly basis, and that's a long time for one's perspectives to develop, evolve, mature. There are things I said six, seven years ago that make me cringe, that if I don't now outright disagree, I could have at least articulated better. So over the next year, we'll be revisiting some topics I covered in the past in a clearer light, because trust me, this good news is much better than we could ever imagine. A lot has happened in four years. The world lost its mind, if it ever had one. I've personally walked through the deepest hell, and I wasn't walking there alone. But I've not been silent during this time. I really feel I've put forward some of my best material. We just wrapped up a 16-month course through the Book of Romans on the Inner Sanctum, our monthly webinar. I did 20 to 30-hour e-courses on... Christology, contemplation, church history, the book of Revelation, plus little shorter video sets on fun topics like the Trinity, sacrament, the new birth, theosis. Now, while you can find these at our website, johncrowder.net, I'm not trying to plug products right here out of the gate. I'm just filling in the gap for you that while the Jesus trip has largely been silent, these were not particularly silent years. Uh, I just wanted to go into more depth and detail on certain subjects than this format allows. But I've definitely been feeling a wind on getting back to the Jesus trip, crank starting this old bird for another ride because she still has plenty of miles left in the engine. I figured a good way to start this new season is with a multi-part series on contemplation. I'm doing 10 parts on this. Contemplation is the most vital spiritual practice of the ancient church, but the evangelical world knows nothing about it or demonizes it because of a thousand misconceptions. It's an exercise in pure grace. And let me say, you have no idea how much you need this. And what better way to start off a new season than with a clickbait title like God Does Not Exist. Now, before you get offended at that, realize this is just Christianity 101. God is not one of many other objects that exist in the universe, an object to be observed or analyzed. No, the great tradition is clear that God does not merely exist as one of many beings. Rather, he is the ground of all existence. He is not just a being, but God is beyond being, beyond existence. Our source, the wellspring from which all existence comes into existence. Therefore, God is the very fabric that holds all things together in their substance. I mean, this is Colossians 1. All things are held together in him, in Jesus. Now, this is not to say God is just an impersonal force, a faceless ultimate reality, universal consciousness, some esoteric source, awareness, whatever. In fact, even G-O-D, God, is a poor word if it uh, connotes a, a solitary, distant, disapproving deity. Okay, God is not an impersonal divine soup, but rather Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this inner triune relationality tells us God is truly personal and personalizing, that God is love as displayed to us not through our own attempts at spiritual discovery, but through his own self-revealing in the incarnation. And this personalizing triune God, who is beyond all being in existence, whose own inner communion of love is expressed to us visibly through the Son, who took on human beingness by becoming object, becoming flesh, the uncreated taking on created body, created soul, created human mind, human spirit. In this singular particularity of the Son's humanity, meaning singular, he is alone the God-man, in this one particularity, God has mystically and vicariously united universally to all creation. And most especially, he has united himself to us, humanity. Everybody is in Jesus, and Jesus is in them, whether they know it or not. This is John 14, 20, Acts 17, 28, Colossians 1, Ephesians 1. It's everywhere. In fact, 
St. Maximus the Confessor, one of my favorite fathers, he says God is not just trapped in his beyond beingness. He is beyond beyond beingness, <laughs> as shown in his stepping into the beingness of humanity. Now, before I relate this to contemplation, let me say folks have a number of hang-ups with the practice of contemplation, which is wordless prayer, okay, at, at the heart, before I can even get to a video defining contemplation. First, many wrongly believe it to be trying to climb into union with God, or that contemplation is merely thinking about God, or converse, that it means forcing out all thoughts, which itself is an impossibility. Likewise, people assume that when they sit down in silence, because their mind goes racing, that they just must not be the contemplative type. No, that's called being human. Those racing thoughts, that reactive mind, is already driving 90% of your life, often fueled by interior anxieties, fears, insecurities, trauma. Contemplation is a practice that actually brings rest from that psychological rat race, where we find ourselves reordered in Christ. It's a practice that runs deeper, far deeper than your intellect, that is helping center your inner man where the Trinity dwells. But all of that will be for another episode. We're going to get into definitions. We'll talk about practical tools given to us by the ancients to better engage with this practice by grace. That will come later. For today, I want to start with the theological necessity of contemplation as a mode of our engagement with God. The question of how we know things, particularly how we know God. Well, that's the study of epistemology, how we actually know. Okay, And just a naked reading of the Bible or going off alone to pray in the woods does not particularly land you at an accurate knowledge of God. The advent of Jesus Christ means that God has become knowable. It tells us God knows and wants to be known. The problem here is the means of knowledge by which we think God is known. He is not known merely through a set of theological principles, by a book, by intellectual or discursive concepts, although all of these things can and should point us to him. The point of the scriptures, for instance, should be to reveal Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ is not merely the accumulation of Bible facts and concepts. God is ineffable, meaning he's beyond all human thought category. He is inexpressible. He is uncontainable, unsearchable beyond all description. By pure human reason, we cannot project our ideas back into the nature of God and understand anything about him. In a very true sense, only God knows himself. The creator-creature distinction lies at the heart of our knowledge of God. God is not discovered by what Paul calls the wisdom from below. If God is going to be apprehended at all, it is only if he is self-revealing. Only God can disclose himself. He has disclosed himself in Jesus Christ. So does that mean our four-pound brains now understand everything there is to know about Jesus Christ? Is this merely human reasoning about Christ, or do we move on to know Christ in a different kind of knowing? Perhaps a knowing that involves some unknowing. How do we know Christ? Well, if he is the God that involves yet is beyond our human intellection, we need a different kind of knowing that transcends mere intellect. It's an intimate knowing, an experiential knowing. And this is a contemplative knowing. It is love. We finite creatures could never know the ineffable, uncreated mystery of God's being unless he brought us into that very being by becoming creation. In his incarnation, he steps down, he condescends to us and elevates us to him, weaving us into the very personal identity of the uncreated God. To sum it up, it is relationship, not just accumulating knowledge about God. We must always maintain a recognition of God's ineffability. Paul maintains this sense of God's unknowability in the New Testament. God, the blessed and only ruler, the king of kings and lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. 1 Timothy 6, 
Oh, the depths and riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. It's Romans eleven thirty three. The ineffability of God refers to our utter inability to describe, explain, or understand him, how he defies any and all attempts at comprehension. There is a vital need for embracing mystery and given space for the unknown in our talk about God. But that mystery has a name. He's a person. You, you can't even know any regular person on the street just by reading a description of them from a book. The psalmist says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. In fact, it says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts, my ways higher than your ways. The psalmist writes, Lord, I am not high-minded. I have no proud looks. I do not exercise myself in great matters which are too high for me. Psalm 131. See, when we bypass this kind of stuff and we think we fully understand everything about God just because we read the Bible and a John MacArthur book, not only have we erred by the hubris of religion, we've actually redacted the infinite beauty of Jesus into a man-made version of him, which is limited and therefore an idol. As an example, there are plenty of folks who worship a very dark, demented, legalistic, or condemning version of God. Yet they still worship him in Jesus' name. They still find a way to cobble together their God contraption from the Bible. So, John O'Donohue says, the spiritual life is about the liberation of God from our images of him. This is, theologically speaking, where the primary role of contemplation comes into play. In contemplation, we're getting behind our man-made God contraptions that we have fabricated behind our Calvinist Jesus, our Pentecostal Jesus, our Catholic Jesus, Democrat Jesus, Republican Jesus. And the goal is not that so we can now go and make a new God contraption, although that's unavoidable along the way. We're going from glory to glory as our eyes get clearer. The Lord is constantly shattering our limited images of him, our God boxes, so that we can truly have God himself. You can call this deconstruction, but deconstruction can just be a polarizing, trendy new word for something that Jesus himself comes on the very scene to do, to tell all the professional religious guys that no one knows God except the one who comes from the Father's bosom, the Word himself who is God and was with God from before all worlds. C.S. Lewis famously said, My idea of God is not a divine idea. It has to be shattered time after time. He shatters it himself. He is the great iconoclast. Could we not almost say that this shattering is one of the marks of his presence? I mean, even the famous Calvinist preacher, Charles Spurgeon, noted, I dare say that we think that we magnify him, but in reality, we belittle him with our highest thoughts. Now, guys, we indeed know Christ. His sheep hear his voice. So again, the question returns, how do we know? Did the guy in the robe and the sandals physically walk into your room? Do we just conjure up a bunch of imaginary pictures in a charismatic meeting and call them visions? Well, we know him by the Spirit, of course. But that's far from a mere intellectual knowledge and much richer than our subjective imaginary visions. Even our conception of the human mind, how the mind and logic work, the intellect, the reason. We have a far less mystical view of the mind than does the East. Mind, intellect, reason. See, in the Eastern Church, the word noose is so much more than that. The noose is the aspect of our soul or spirit that is the image of God within us, Jesus. It incorporates our thinking, but our noose is much more spiritual. It is our God-breathed center. It's that aspect of us, that divine image of Jesus that recognizes God. It goes beyond intellect to a spiritual apprehension. So in the Eastern Fathers and Mystics, you'll read much about the noose, noetic awareness, uh, what we may call the practice of the presence of God. And this is core to what repentance is truly all about. See, our life of repentance is not about getting on God's good side. He only has a good side. And as you likely know, repentance in Greek is metanoia, which we often define as change your mind. 
in realizing how good God is, how loving, how merciful, how holy we are now, thanks to him, well, this has dramatic implications on how our outward lives are transformed. But see, that is still a rather Western way of looking at it. When we think of the renewal of the mind, we often just consider this to be a changing of the data in there. But metanoia is much more spiritual. It's most literally this, be transformed by the transfiguration of your noose. There's a transfiguring aspect as our inner man beholds him, not just ideas about him, because it's there we find our true origin, our authentic blueprint. We begin to reflect that in the way of our being. Our entire conceptual apparatus for reality is altered. Paul never says we're going to fully comprehend the mystery. He says we have fellowship with the mystery. Christ will always be the mystery, but he's the mystery revealed. He holds nothing back. Now, this makes evangelicals deathly afraid because we take security in our pat answers. We fear the unknown, fear of losing control, to lose the God box they believe in. But the goal is to encounter a more Christ-like God than the one we've concocted with our broken human projections. In letting go, we might just bump into a Jesus who's a better version than our own personal limited Jesus, a bigger, better Jesus. But that also means losing the reins on that remote control God who operates according to our paradigms. You press this button, you put that coin in the slot, and then everything in life is going to go well with you. But we fear losing a God who is beyond our ability to grasp and therefore dominate and even weaponize. So there's two sides to this coin. He is the mystery, and he's the mystery revealed. We must still let God be God, and yet he is only the God revealed in Jesus, who perfectly images the Father. So this is not the frustration of an unrevealed mystery. He's not holding anything back. You're never going to turn a corner and find out God doesn't look like Jesus, but Jesus is still transcendent and ineffable, and thus should inspire not frustration, but rather it tells us we've been plunged into eternal awe-inspiring wonder. We will never exhaust the mystery of his goodness. Boredom may be part of our struggle at times, but boredom is ultimately not in the economy of heaven. Forever we will be amazed at his uncontainable brilliance. Contemplation is this wonder. So there's an intentional degree of unknowing that we must embrace with divine things. It's never to say that God is different than Jesus, but rather a humble acknowledgement that Jesus is always going to be far better than I can currently comprehend, which means I have a comfort and security and a stasis in him, a safe home, a harbor. It's not like he's constantly pulling the rug out from under me in an unsafe way. But there, I I will never have arrived at something where I reach, I acquire uh, some full systematic rational comprehension. Relationship is not acquisition. It's not arrival. Eugene Peterson said systematic theology is an oxymoron. So the way by which we relate here is not mere mind, though it surely involves that, but love. There's a higher reason that is more uh, than thought and intellect. Maximus says, perfected reason cleaves in a manner beyond cognition, solely to the all-blessed silence that transcends intellection. He said, reason and intellection cannot in any way give expression to this silence, which is revealed only to those who have experienced it through direct participation, having been counted worthy of spiritual joy, transcending all intellection. Joy unspeakable. This silence beyond words is so vital to contemplative practice. Maximus writes, he is beyond being and even infinitely transcends the attribution of beyond beingness. For God is not an object of knowledge or predication so that he might be intellectually grasped by the soul according to a certain condition, but rather is grasped according to simple union, unconditioned and beyond all thought. For Maximus, mystical experience is not about some abstract, unknowable God. The one who is even infinitely beyond beingness is the man Jesus Christ. But true knowledge of Jesus is not mere knowledge, but participation. Now, Maximus' dense Christological grounding makes him the best of the mystical theologians. 
Yet he says, this state is known only by experience, not with concepts and words. Now, there's a term for the type of theology I'm giving you, which has its beginning back in the earliest of church fathers, Origen, the Nicene fathers, Evagrius, Dionysius, Maximus. And it predominates mainly in the East, but also there's a rich tradition in the Western church mystics, and it's called apophatic or negative theology. Not negative in the sense it is bad. Just to explain, here in the Western world, most of us grew up with just positive theological language, telling us positively what God is like. God is this, God is that. God is good, God is sovereign, God is just. And this is radically important, and it's not wrong, it's just incomplete. I mean, we don't even know what sovereignty is, what justice ultimately looks like from God's perspective, okay? It's beyond us. God is good, positively, yes, but in a negative way, apophatic way, you would say God's goodness is beyond our human comprehension. Now, that by no means entails that God would ever do something evil, and then some schmuck or preacher would just say, uh, well, his goodness is different than our goodness. No, that's reprehensible. He's at least as good as our fumbling human understanding of goodness. But look, a ton of our words are already negative or apophatic, okay? God is, for instance, unlimited, not limited, immortal, not mortal, infinite, not finite, okay? Often, we can only say what he's not. See, uh, to even talk about God, we're stretching the boundaries of human language. Now, Gregory of Nyssa, the father of fathers, who helped draft the Nicene Creed, which gives us positive language for who, what God is, who God is. He is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Well, Gregory, like all the early fathers, was also mystical, very apophatic. At one point, he says, to talk of God, there is the seeing that consists in not seeing, because that which is sought transcends all knowledge, being separated on all sides by incomprehensibility. He writes, every thought grasped by the mind becomes an obstacle to those who search. And St. Basil the Great, also one of the Cappadocian fathers, hand, uh, handing us the creed, he says, every theological statement falls short of the understanding of the speaker. Our understanding is weak and our tongue is even more defective. Now, is this to say that we just throw out all theological talk, theological language? God forbid. These men were the greatest theologians. But why? Their heart and mind were not divided and parsed out. They knew the Trinity was a mystery beyond language, and they spent time in silent contemplation laying aside their thought and just being with God. An early mystical theologian, a Vagrius the Solitary. I suppose you don't get a name like a Vagrius the Solitary because you go clubbing. Well, he said, God cannot be grasped by the mind. If he could be grasped, he would not be God. And Evagrius gives us a very important lesson on contemplative prayer. He says, happy is the spirit that attains to the perfect formlessness at the time of prayer. Perfect formlessness at the time of prayer. We aren't just sitting down with our preconceived ideas about God. We aren't trying to picture Jesus on a boat in Galilee or trying to have a vision of him riding a unicorn over a rainbow. This formlessness, it means letting go of our own conceptualizations of God in silent contemplation, where we let go of our thoughts and ideas and imaginations about God and just be with him. Good God thoughts will pop up. Uh, but in the practice of contemplation, we learn not even to cling to those. Now, yes, our minds are vital tools in our relationship to God and the world, but contemplation and theology can never start uh, stand apart from one another. In today's church, we tend to uh, divide up academics from charismatics, mystics from theologians, but the contemplative and the theologian must be one whole complete man. Mind and heart are not divided. There is no true theology without experience, and our contemplation must be grounded in Christology because Jesus is the God we're contemplating. Christology is the only true theology, and our Christology must be done contemplatively, because if we don't actually get to know the one we're talking about, then we're just talking out our rear end. So the mystics and the church fathers were actually the original deconstructionists. I mean, in fact, Meister Eckhart, he went so far as to say, I pray God to rid me of God. He knew that his own perspective of God was tainted by a thousand outside influences. But we don't go so headlong deconstructionism that we skip past Jesus. 
See, in their apophaticism, the, the fathers have, in a sense, always been doing deconstruction, but grounded in the truth. That truth is a person. Jesus is our only knowledge of God because he is God's own self-revelation. You see, they deconstructed themselves into the faith, not out of it. Contemplation is about engaging with the Trinity at a level beyond images, beyond lofty religious ideas. It is seeing him with the eyes of the heart, because to behold him is to be like him. And as Thomas Merton writes, in silence, God ceases to be an object and becomes an experience. We've got some fun in-person gatherings coming to a region near you in 2024. So before you go, let me tell you where I'm headed. I'll be in Albuquerque, New Mexico in August. I'll be in New England coming to Massachusetts in October. In November, I'll be with Dr. C. Baxter Kruger in Germany, as well as in Switzerland. And I'll be in Middle America in Ohio in December. Check it out, johncrowder.net. Check out our monthly live web conference platform, The Inner Sanctum, at thenewmystics.tv. It's where I give live, full-length lectures, interactive Q&A sessions, Plus, you have hundreds of hours of archived teaching, Bible commentary found nowhere else. And your small membership fee helps support our orphanages and missions around the world. So it's a win-win. Finally, please visit our main site, johncrowder.net, where you can find upcoming events like this ministry cruise to Alaska, September 2024, with myself and Dr. C. Baxter Kruger. You'll find our extended on-demand e-courses like this 20-hour module on Christology. We've also got 20 hours just on contemplation. A really fun one, Drunk Church History. It's about 30 hours long. And our most recent on the book of Revelation that will change everything you thought about the apocalypse. So visit the page and you'll see we also have our longest e-course to date, Coming up live this summer, 2024, with myself, Dr. Baxter Kruger, Rod Williams. We're spending three whole months on Holy Spirit. And for those taking the online course, at the end of those 12 weeks, we will have an optional in-person activation gathering in Florida that is absolutely going to explode. Find everything at johncrowder.net. Plunge into the depths of the gospel of grace and sign up for Cana New Wine Seminary. Explore the heart of the Trinity, the ancient faith, the finished work of the cross. It's supernatural and presence-oriented. The online format makes it an extremely affordable theology course, and it's a rare opportunity to drink from some amazing teachers once a week. Catch the early bird discount rate at cana.co.